see you out today. Good to be here. Amen. I want to bring you a message today from Luke's Gospel, chapter 1. I encourage you to turn there right now. I don't have the verses on the screen today. It'll be in Luke's Gospel, chapter 1, first 18 verses. I'll be in the New International Version, the 1984 model. You open up your Bible, Luke chapter 1. Luke explains and he, he's drawn up. He says he studied everything and he's going to draw up an account of all that's taken place. And after a period, a period of time that expands, uh, extends there, about 400 years from the last pages of your Old Testament, the book of Malachi, chapter 4, to Luke chapter 1, it's been about 400 years. No prophecies, no prophets, no angels, no word from the Lord. But it's coming. And this message is called, You Better Believe It. From Luke chapter 1, beginning at verse 1, the Bible says this. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us. Just as they were handed down to us. By those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. Therefore, since I myself have carefully investigated everything, from the beginning, it seemed good also to me to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zachariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife Elizabeth was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were upright in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commandments and regulations blamelessly. But they had no children because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both well along in years. Once, when Zachariah's division was on duty and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time for the burning of incense came, all the assembled worshipers were standing. They weren't just standing, man. They were praying. All the assembled worshipers were praying outside. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw the angel, when he saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son and you are to give him the name John. He will be a joy and light to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from birth. <coughs> he will be filled with the Holy Spirit, it says there. Even from birth. Many of the people of Israel will he bring back to the Lord their God. And he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous and to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah asked the angel, <clears throat> How can I be sure of this? I'm an old man, and my wife is well along in years. Let's pray. Father, we continue to pray 
praise and thank you today. You're worthy of all praise. We thank you. Father, may we realize um, from Zachariah's experience that from your spoken words that created all the world, everything that exists, may we realize your word is powerful and your word is what we can put our hope in. Your word is what we can build our lives on. And doing that means we build our lives on the solid rock as Jesus instructed. Father, help us to believe and help us to act on that faithfully to obey your word in everything because as it is written, we better believe it. Thank you for your love and mercy. We ask that you grow your church because the increase is always yours no matter who plants the seed and who waters the seed. We ask it in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. So, in Luke chapter 1, as we started there, a few of those verses, it says in verse 2, Luke says, These things were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the Word. Now the Word there is the same word that's used, that John uses, John chapter 1, verse 1, that says, In the beginning was the the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And that Word is, in the Greek, Logos, L-O-G-O-S. And uh, in the beginning was the Word, and John's Gospel is capitalized, in the beginning was the Word. And he says in verse 14, John does, John 1 verse 14, The Word became flesh, God became flesh, made His dwelling among us, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. But in Luke's Gospel, Luke says in different words, the same thing. The Word is the same Word, uh, Logos, L-O-G-O-S. But he says these things were handed down to us by those who were eyewitnesses. Eyewitnesses of the Word. Now it looks a little different in Luke's Gospel, but I'm convinced he's saying the same thing. He says these things were handed down to us by those who saw it, who experienced it, who know it. And Luke says, I've investigated all of it, man. I looked into it. I've carefully investigated everything from the beginning. And it seemed good to me because of that. It seemed good to me to write an orderly account for you, the most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. Now, when you read in the book of Colossians, Colossians chapter 4, if you study that, you'll find that Luke was not Jewish. He's the only non-Jewish writer in the entire Old Testament. That's pretty unique. So he wasn't a Jew. He's, uh, he's Greek. And he is a... Uh, did I miss one? He wasn't a writer in the Old Testament. Oh, not the Old Testament. Not the, <laughs> thank you, thank you. I knew that. I knew that, man. I messed up. I saw a look on the face there. <laughs> Luke wrote in the New Testament. In the New Testament. He's the only non-Jewish writer in the New Testament. So uh, that's unique about it. He writes in the book of Colossians. In Colossians, Paul writes in the book of Colossians that Luke's not a Jew, he's a Gentile. But he studied this. He says, I've investigated. I've heard about this guy. We know Luke was a physician or a doctor. And he says, so we expect he's educated. He, he catches on quickly. And he's heard about this guy named Jesus. And he investigates and he looks into it and he, he digs a little deeper. And maybe he, he interviews some people. And he says, I've determined this is true. And Theophilus, we don't know who that is. But I believe, and many scholars do, it's, it's a person. It's a New Testament Christian. That was being convinced. This, this is what it, we've heard. This is what I found to be true. And you can be sure of what you have been taught. And Luke writes to the office. As the story begins, it says, In the time of Herod, king of Judea. Now Luke writes two books in your New Testament. He writes the Gospel of Luke. He, he writes the book of Acts. But in those two books, he, he includes... 54 cities, 32 countries, and 9 islands. He's very descriptive about rulers and who's in control and who's governors and who's, it, who's got the power. And he does that, see, for, for accuracy. You can check it. You can look it up. Not just in the Bible. You can look up other historical <coughs> records. And you see it adds up, man. In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah, and his wife Elizabeth was also a descendant of Aaron. And we understand that's 
passed the law of Moses, priest. They introduced people to God. Uh, our Sunday school this morning was on priesthood. And when you read Hebrews, book of Hebrews, chapter 2, chapter 4, chapter 5, 6, 7, and 8, you've got to realize Jesus Christ is our high priest. Because that's what Hebrews says. The priesthood was there for that reason. Jesus is the fulfillment. And as Christians, we are priests today. And if you believe that, then your head like this right here. That's the Word of God. Um, among other places, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. You are a royal priesthood, the Lord said. Zechariah was a priest. And it says about he and his wife, Elizabeth, they were both upright. It says they observed all the Lord's commandments and regulations blamelessly. Now when you study the Bible, they could be, in fact, the only folks I can think of off the top of my head who are described this way. Man, they kept the law. Now we know they weren't perfect. They sinned. But it says they kept it and they, they did so blamelessly. That's pretty impressive. But here's the deal. They're serving. They love the Lord. They're serving. They're from the tribe of Levi and he's a priest. And it says they had no children because, you know, if you don't have children, sometimes it's his fault. Sometimes it's her fault, you know. Well, this one's her fault. It says that Elizabeth was barren and they're both getting old. <laughs> they're both well along in years. I mean, share to share with you a side note here. If the Lord's going to grant you with children, bless you with children, I'm fully convinced it's going to happen at just the right time. Among other people, have you ever heard of a lady named Sarah? Her husband was Abram, and then Abraham. Happens at just the right time. Have you ever heard of a lady named Hannah? You've heard of the prophet Samuel? That's his mommy. It happens at just the right time. For Zechariah and Elizabeth in their old age, it happens at just the right time. But they're old, you know. And maybe they've given up. Maybe it's been a while since Zechariah even prayed about it. Have you ever prayed about something? You pray about it, you want a door to open, you want something to happen, you want an opportunity, and you pray about it, and you're hoping for it, and you're looking forward to it, and you're petitioning God about it, and it doesn't happen for, for a month, doesn't happen for a year, it doesn't happen for a decade, man. Do you ever just quit? You just quit praying about it? I think many of us have been there before, maybe we're there now. But God hears, and God answers at the right time. And Zechariah is chosen to go into the temple to burn incense. Now, incense is a mixture like a, a good smelling stuff like perfume. They would burn it in the temple. That was a holy place. That's what God said to do in the law of Moses. So the priest would get to do that. Now, the priest would draw, would cast lots, it's called. And that's similar to uh, like drawing straws. You know, who gets to go, whose turn is it? And who gets to go, who, who the lot falls to? Now, sometimes it's bad. We know the, the soldiers at the cross of Jesus, they cast lots for Jesus' clothes. But sometimes it was good. In the Old Testament, they would use they would cast lots to find out if they should go to battle or not. In the New Testament, the, the 11 apostles cast lots to find out who should take Judas' place after he betrayed Jesus. So casting lots is common. And they cast lots, and the lot falls to Zechariah, so he gets to go in. Now, when he goes into the temple of the Lord... There's, there's a place called the holy place. And then behind the veil is what's called the most holy place. And in the, the regular holy place, there's a table. It's made of acacia wood. It's 22 inches wide, 22 inches long, and it's 44 inches high. And it's covered with gold according to the law of Moses. But on this table, that's where they would do the burning of incense. And it was his turn. It's a privilege. He's serving as priest. He's going in there by himself. And it says all the people are praying outside. And as he goes into the temple, this holy man, righteous, blameless, who spent his life, you know what priests did? They spent their life studying the Scriptures, preparing, trying to, to intercede for people, mankind, and God. They were the go-between, you see. And they were introducing people to God. That was his life, his livelihood. Man, he studied the Scriptures. I believe you knew the Old, Old Testament, if you study it, uh, the priest. It varies on where you study at, what you find. But it's undisputed they had an extensive amount of the law of Moses memorized word for word. He spent his life serving God, studying the Scriptures, introducing people to God. That's who he was. That's what he did. And he goes into the temple on this day 
the Lord's temple that had been destroyed. Solomon first built it. It was destroyed and it was rebuilt. And Herod, we know King Herod, he spent 46 years renovating the temple. Like a full body off restoration, so to speak. And he renovates the temple. That's in John chapter 2. 46 years to redo the temple. And he gets to go in, Zechariah does, he goes into the temple to burn incense. And I want you to just think, of all of his study and all of his efforts and all the memorization and everything he was and stood for, he's blameless, he's holy, he's righteous, he's all that kind of stuff. And he spent his life devoted to studying the Scriptures. And I want you to think, it's been 400 years. It's been 400 years. There's no prophets. There are no prophecies. There's no angels, angelic revelation. It's silence. It's a period of silence from the Old Testament to the New. But he spent his life studying about the Old Testament. He spent his life maybe hanging on every word from the Old Testament. He knows what Malachi said 400 years ago. He knows that before the day of the Lord comes, Elijah is going to come. He knows that. It's in, his, it's in his mind. It's on his mind every day. It's who he is. And he goes into the temple. And there, standing beside the right side of the altar of incense, he sees an angel. That's what it says. Then an angel appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. And the angel gives him what we've already looked at once. The angel said, your prayer has been heard. If you think God answers prayer, do you head like this right here? Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear your son. You're to give him the name John. He will be enjoying the life to you. Many will rejoice because of his birth. He will be great in the sight of the Lord. He's never take wine or other for me to drink. It says he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous. And do you know? Do you know what has to be going through his mind? At that moment, the, the last words, the last words of the Old Testament, Malachi chapter 4, it's only like six verses long, but the last words of the Old Testament 400 years before, you know what it said? It says, I will send you, before all this happens, I will send you the prophet Elijah, before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn... The prophet Malachi said 400 years ago, he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to the father. Elijah is coming. And this righteous and holy priest goes into the Lord's temple to burn incense and he hears the angel declare. There had not been an angel for 400 years, but he's there now at the right side of the altar and he says, your wife will give birth. He will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah. Hear what he says, verse 17. He will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah knows what the angel's saying. He knows what the prophet had said and it's all coming true, fulfillment in his presence, in his family, with his wife. It's going to be his son. John the Baptist was born to Zechariah and Elizabeth. And he was Elijah who was supposed to come. And that's not my idea. It's what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 11. You can disagree with me, man, but you can't disagree with Jesus, okay? That's in Matthew chapter 11. Zechariah knows everything he lived for, everything he's looking forward to, it's coming to fulfillment. And it's his family. And you know what he says? He says in verse 18, <clears throat> Mr. Angel, because his name hasn't been announced yet. It is announced, but not yet. Mr. Angel, uh, how can I be sure that this is going to happen? And I'm just guessing the angel's there scratching his head. Man, this, this, these creatures are a lot more stupid than they look. Because <laughs> we're made in the image of God, you know. How can I be sure of this? I'm an old man. And my wife is well on in years. And the angel says, my name is Gabriel. And I stand in the presence of God. And he sent me to tell you this good news. How can I be sure of this? You see, it's a shame. This man is holy and righteous. He spent his life studying the scriptures, memorizing and knowing. And he knows all the right stuff and all the right idea and the theology. He's got it all right. In this revelation, he sees an angel and it's his family and it's his, it's his position. And, and it's the word of God. And all he can do 
His question, how can I be sure of this? And it brings us to the point of the sermon where we've got to say, what about me, man? This is what happens in Luke chapter 1. This is what happens to Zechariah 2,000 years ago, preacher. But what about me? I was hoping you'd ask. You know, as Christians, I think we spend so much time with, we're going to go to church, we're going to, we're going to do our Bible study, we're going to pray, we're going to, we're going to learn, we're going, to, we're going to do this stuff, we're going to do the religious stuff, we're going to study the Scripture, we might even have some memory verses, we're going to work on it, we're going to go through it, we're going to get this stuff right, we're going to be holy and blameless and righteous. And sometimes we don't even hear what God is saying, speaking into our lives and guiding us with His Holy Spirit. I mean, for example, you, you might think, I've been a Christian, I've been going to church and doing this and doing that, but should I really go talk to my neighbor about becoming a Christian? Should I really? How can I be sure of this? Well, God, the Bible says, God wants all men to be saved and come to knowledge of the truth. Amen. That's what God wants. It's His desire. We don't have to doubt it. That's who we are. We're Christians, and that's what we're, we're born again to do, is to share the good news. And to live with hope. How can I be sure of this? Because it's the Word of God, we better believe it. You know. Well, you hear sermons about a, maybe generosity or something on TV, and that religious channel, man, they get you to give money faster than you ever seen. You hear something that's moving, it's, it's a moving example, and they, they do preach some tremendous sermons, especially on giving. I mean, they, and you're moved by it, you know. And you see this stuff, maybe documentaries on people around the world that don't have enough to eat. And you're moved and you're touched. And then you say to yourself, how can I be sure that that's what God wants me to do? Because God wants all men to be saved and come to knowledge of the truth. Amen. The Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should be called repentance. That's, that's who He is and what He wants. And, and He uses that. He uses He works through us. Do you know that in the United States there is one paid clergy member for every 180 people that you see, there is one paid church member, official. But there are about 3 billion people on this planet that don't even have access to a Bible. Can you see we're missing the boat when we're all concerned about who's going to cut the grass and paint the building? When we got people around the world going to hell and they've never heard the gospel? God wants us to do something about it, you see. How can I be sure of this? That's whose we are and what we're part of. The minister at, at Cole Run, the Cole Run Church of Christ, Jerry Bliffin, his brother had preached for over 30 years named Jim. Jim and his wife, they raised their kids. Their kids moved out. They're serving in, the, in their Christians. They're serving the Lord. And Jim and his wife, they sold everything they had just like a year and a half ago. They sold everything they had. They auctioned it off. They gave it away. Everything they had and they're serving as missionaries in Papua New Guinea now. How can I be sure if that's what God wants me to do? We're His hands and feet. He's using, He works through us because we're Christians, because He loved us first, we love Him, and because of His patience and mercy, He's using us for His glory. How can we be sure of it? Why are we still doubting? Maybe you can, maybe you can teach a class. Maybe, maybe you can start a ministry. There may be something we've never tried before. Maybe we did try it, it's been years ago. Maybe you can do something. You can get to work. Man, how can I be sure of this? Because we are God's workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. That's Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10. That's what we are. It's what we're born again for. How can I be sure of this? I think we're, we're a lot more like Zachariah than we care to admit. How can we be sure because it's God's word, because He's leading us with His Spirit, because it's His plan? That's how. If you're here today and you're not a Christian, and you say, preacher, I've heard this so many times, I've heard so many sermons before, but how, really, man, how can I be sure? I mean, you all teach me God is love and all that kind of stuff, and the hairs on my head are all numbered, but how can I be sure? You don't, you don't know how to be sure? It's a book that was written over a period of 1,600 years by 40 different men or so. From cover to cover, it fits together in perfect harmony. It's the best-selling book of all time. When they tell you which book is the best-seller this year, they exclude the Bible because there's been so many copies printed that they have no idea how many's out there. Since the printing press was invented, the Bible rules the chart, you see. How can I be sure of this? You can be sure of it because the Bible says God has a Son. And His name is Jesus. 
And he laid his life down for our sin. Our sin required blood. And the blood of the righteous one came and covers all sin that will ever be. How can you be sure of this? Because Calvary's real. How can I be sure that this guy named Jesus that all these people claim to follow, how can I be sure, man, that he is who he says he is? You can be sure. Because the tomb of Jesus Christ is empty today. You can be sure by the testimony of Christian people in this room and around the world whose lives are changed because of the power in Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit of God Almighty. How can I know for sure? How could you not know? How could you not see the love of Christian people and the testimony of saints around the world? You've got to climb over that mountain and end up in hell. How could you not know? Can you see from this story? From this story, God's in control. God has a plan. Can you see here that God works in the silence? Can you see that? Zachariah had been 400 years. He's been serving. He's been memorizing. He's been, he's been working. He thought God wasn't doing anything. No angels, no prophets. And there's nothing going on here. There's nothing happening. But can you see there was something happening? The Medes and the Persians, they ruled around 400 B.C. And then the Greeks came on the scene about 280 B.C. The Greeks conquered the world. Philip did first. And then his son Alexander the Great finished it off. Alexander the Greeks ruled the world. And for the first time since the Tower of Babel, everybody could speak a little Greek. You know what that meant? That meant for the first time some Old Testament scriptures were printed in the Greek language so that people of all nations could find out and learn about this Hebrew God. They could hear it for the first time. Do you know that in, in what was it, uh, less than 100 B.C., the Romans defeated the Greeks, the Roman Empire you studied about in school? The Roman Empire, it was a period of peace called the Pax Romana for 200 years, but it started there before Christ was born, and roadways were built, and there was a period of peace, and synagogues were built in every major city. Can you see that God is tilling the soil? It looks like nothing's happening. No angels, no prophecies, no revelation. Nothing's going on, man. But God was preparing the world for the greatest thing that it would ever know. For His Son, for His love, for Calvary, for the hope of heaven, for all nations. Can you see God's at work in silence? Maybe you're praying today. You've been praying for decades, maybe. You're hoping something would happen, but it's never happened. And maybe you're just waiting. You're waiting for an answer. We've been 2,000 years since the last page of the New Testament was written. And maybe you say, man, God, God's not doing nothing. There's no angels appearing. There's no prophecies. There's no revelation. But just like Zechariah, Zechariah goes into the temple and right where God left off 400 years prior where he said, Elijah will come before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Elijah will come and when God says that in the Old Testament, he picks up right there in the new. Can you see? It seems like God's doing nothing. It seems like nothing's happening. It seems like nothing's going on. But he's got a plan. And Christian, he's using you to do it. I encourage you. He's working in the silence. And he's going to appear and he's going to pick up right where he left off. In Acts chapter 1, as Jesus ascended into heaven, the Bible says this, The same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. And since He ascended to glory, that's been the message. And when the last words of the New Testament were written, this is included. In Revelation chapter 22, John says, He who testifies to these things, that's Jesus. Jesus says, yes, I am coming soon. And John says, amen, come Lord Jesus. It appears like nothing's happening. It appears like nothing's going on, man. People are getting married and building families and going to colleges and getting degrees and going to work. And I'm going to work this week like I went to work last week. And it seems like nothing's going on. But God's at work. And He's using Christian people, those that love Him. Your faith is credited as righteousness. And your work is His hands and feet. And He's patient. Not willing that any should perish. And He's waiting for the lost to come home. Today, if you have a decision, if you have a decision to become a Christian, I'm required, I'm obligated, I'm obligated to tell you that you need to believe. You need to repent of all your sin. You need to confess the name of Christ. You need to be baptized into Christ. For the forgiveness of sins and to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, you've got to be faithful. Until either you die or the Lord returns to His church. Because when people follow Jesus, that's what they did. 
in the New Testament. If you're here today and you're not a Christian, if you're here today and you want to rededicate your life, we're going to sing number 614. And as we all sing, as we all stand and we all sing, if you have a decision, it's the time that you, you can decide, that you can put your faith in action, that you can step out on faith, that you can make your calling, your election sure. You can be saved today through obedience to the Word as we all stand and sing. Won't you come?